All right, this is Simeon. He's going to introduce me. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everyone, for coming today. Uh, this is Scott. <laughs> Scott Lawrence. Uh, he's from the University of Colorado, and he came in uh, to give this uh, talk titled Convexity in Quantum yeah. Physics. <laughs> Thank you, Simeon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. So my talk is titled Convexity in Quantum Physics. This will turn by the end into an algorithms and methods talk. Um, at the beginning, it will be a quantum physics talk. Um, we don't have many people here. Please feel free to just interrupt with questions and shout them at me. Um, that makes giving a talk much easier. And this is based on uh, two papers, both of which are on the archives, both of which are in November, but of different years, uh, if you want to look stuff up. OK, so quantum mechanics describes a lot of systems. This is not meant to show you anything other than, yeah, you know, there are a lot of systems, all of which are described by the same fundamental axioms of quantum mechanics. Like, we can be talking about spins or about neutron stars or about very fancy refrigerators or about uh, heavy ion collisions, and all of them sort of share an axiom system. So if we can understand that axiom system and what we can do with it, then uh, there are a lot of different systems to which we can apply our insights. So the ingredients of quantum mechanics, you sort of know we have a vector space of states. If we're being mathematicians, then maybe I care that that's a Hilbert space and it's complete. Uh, I don't care about that today. Today, it's just a vector space. There's an inner product on that space of states, which is positive definite. So if you take any state psi and take the inner product with itself, then that inner product is greater than zero um, as long as psi is non-zero. Uh, for today, I only need a slightly weaker condition that it's positive semi-definite. So no matter what state psi I pick, the inner mm -hmm. product is greater than or equal to zero. It can't be negative. Mm -hmm. um, that isn't to say that inner products can't be negative. It's the inner product of a state with itself that can't be negative. I have a collection of Hermitian observables. What that collection is depends on the physical question, physical system in question. I have a Hamiltonian, which is a particular Hermitian observable. What that Hamiltonian is depends on the physical system in question. And lastly, there are a couple objects that I might be interested in uh, to sort of do calculations on. So I might say want to study real-time evolution. That's the unitary operator generated by the Hamiltonian. Or I might just want to study the ground state, right? And this is the unique eigenstate, well, hopefully unique eigenstate of the, of the Hamiltonian that has a low, the lowest eigenvalue. Um, and for today, I will almost almost exclusively be talking about trying to get to ground state physics. So that's ultimately the goal. There won't be any real-time evolution today. Right. So we can ask, yeah, so we can ask different things. We can ask about ground state. We can ask about thermal physics. We can ask about real-time evolution. And today, the emphasis is on ground state physics or zero temperature physics. So for example of a, I might as well stand down here, I think. For the example of a quantum system that we're all familiar with, we have the harmonic oscillator. So the Hilbert space here is just a wave functions on the real line. And we have this Hamiltonian, which looks like a sum of position squared and momentum squared. Well, what can we say about this? Well, the main axiom that I want to emphasize is this one in blue at the top, right? That the inner product is positive semi-definite. It's the only axiom that's an inequality. So let's apply that. So in any state, I pick a state and I take the inner product of it with itself. And one state I can I can take an inner product with, I can start with the ground state and apply operator x. If I do that, applying the axiom, I find that the expectation value of x squared has to be non-negative, which is maybe obvious. And the expectation value of p squared has to be non-negative, which is maybe obvious. And if I combine those, I find the expectation value of the Hamiltonian is non-negative. Uh, and that's great. It's a lower bound on the ground state energy. We've excluded half of the real line. That's a lot of progress. Um, we can actually do better. So there's no reason why the tightest possible bound should be given by considering these two states. Uh, so I can do better if I use the uncertainty principle and I consider the state, I start with the ground state and I apply the operator x plus i b. So by the way, yeah. your point eventually is going to be that the right-hand side of that inequality is greater than zero in, in, in the cases that where you can actually apply this. Right, because greater than zero is kind of uh, sort of 
it's true for every system because how can you have negative energy? Or okay, so the Hamiltonian to be this minus two, then we have negative energy. Yes, I, I mean, that's like really annoying and pedantic, but but the a shift in the Hamiltonian isn't interesting one way or another. But yeah, the point the point is ultimately going to be not that the Hamiltonian is greater than or zero, greater than or equal to zero, but that the Hamiltonian expectation value plus or minus some number is going to be greater than or equal to zero. And if that number is large, then we have something impressive, right? So in the case, in the harmonic oscillator case, we sort of do this and we find that this expectation value has to be greater than or equal to zero. But this looks like the Hamiltonian expectation value plus, plus i, or plus the real part of i. Um, and so this, this is the classic proof that the expectation value of the Hamiltonian for the harmonic oscillator has to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2. But that, and that just comes from the uncertainty principle from using the commutator of x and p. Okay. Then another example, we can do sort of the same trick. We can look at a spin system. Now the Hamilton, now that Hilbert space is just two dimensional. And now a good state to look at is, uh, uh, let's start again with the ground state, an unknown state, but apply one plus sigma x. And same method, the inner product of it with itself has to be greater than or equal to zero. And we find that the expectation value of sigma x is bounded below by negative one. And that corresponds to a bound on the, on the expectation value of the Hamiltonian of, of mu. Right. Um, in both cases, you can just go ahead and diagonalize the Hamiltonian, and you find that these bounds are tight. This is because these systems are well chosen to have tight bounds. Okay, this usually won't be the case for interesting physical systems. So let's, in the, in the hopes of being able to generalize this method, let's be a bit more systematic about what's going on. First of all, there's no point going through this rigmarole of talking about, okay, prepare a state by taking the ground state and apply an operator. We're just going to consider uh, expectation values of the form O dagger O for some operator O. And that's always greater than or equal to zero. This is a consequence of positivity of the inner product. And then considering some basis of operators, so O1 through ON will be linearly independent. We can build a matrix, an n by n matrix M of expectation values. And the consequence of positive definiteness of the inner product is that this matrix M is positive semi-definite. What I mean by that, there are multiple equivalent phrasings. One is that all the eigenvalues of M are non-negative. So it can have zero eigenvalues uh, because there can be operators O that annihilate the vacuum, but it can't have any negative eigenvalues. Equivalently for any vector V, if you look at V dagger MV, this has to be greater than or equal to zero. And the reason for that is that this is just, uh, it's the positivity bound when you take V dot O as your operator. Okay. If you, I will sort of assert this baldly and not try to convince you of it too hard. Um, it's certainly true in finite dimensional systems. If you have a complete set of operators, so every Hermitian operator on your Hilbert space is in the span of O1 through ON, then this is actually the entirety of the positivity axiom is captured by uh, this matrix M being positive semi-definite. Okay. And therefore, all of the inequalities that describe your quantum mechanical system are in this one requirement that M is PSD. So this is a specific case of what's called a semi-definite program. So let's see be some, you know, see as some N by N matrix just like our matrix of expectation values. And we want to find a positive semi-definite matrix. Sorry, that's a misspoke, I'm sorry. Okay, X is going to correspond to our matrix of expectation values. We want it to be positive semi-definite. And we want to find an X that minimizes some linear combination of the matrix elements of X. So that linear combination is the Hamiltonian, right? So the Hamiltonian in the harmonic oscillator case was x squared plus p squared, x squared expectation value and p squared expectation value are both diagonal elements of the matrix X. So we've got a linear, uh, a linear optimization problem. We constrain it to the space of positive semi-definite matrices. And moreover, there are some linear constraints on the matrix elements of X. These come from, for instance, the commutation relations, okay? So for instance, the expectation value of xp and px are not linearly independent. 
So looking at the one spin case again, we can just write down this big matrix M explicitly. Uh, so we have, you should think of this as the expectation value of one times one, the expectation value of one times sigma X, the expectation value of one times sigma Y, and so on. Down here, we have the expectation value of say sigma X times sigma Y, which is of course that of I sigma Z. And so this matrix has to be positive semi-definite. This constraint is true on any quantum state. You write down a density matrix and it will obey the equation in green or the inequality in green, I should say. Um, but what we care about is the ground state physics, and that's identified by minimizing the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. That is by, I guess, maximizing uh, the expectation value of sigma x while obeying positive semi-definiteness. So if we just look at the upper left two by two minor, uh, we see, you can look at this and see that, well, if the expectation value of sigma x was two, then it would no longer be a positive semi-definite matrix. We would have a negative eigenvalue. And so sigma x is bounded between negative one and one. And that turns out to be our tight bound, no matter what the Hamiltonian is. So to visualize what's going on here. So I call this, I keep referring to this, by the way, as, as a convex problem in the title. And what I mean by that is that if you give me any two sets of expectation values, I can average those two expectation values. And if the original two sets of expectation values obeyed uh, the semi-definiteness property, that is that that matrix M was PSD, then so does their average. So the region of permitted expectation values is a convex region. So here for the one spin case, I've drawn expectation value of sigma X and expectation value of Hamiltonian. And the blue region is permitted, and that's a convex region. And then, of course, we want to minimize the Hamiltonian expectation value. And what you imagine here is sort of dropping a ball and letting it roll downhill. Because the region is convex, this procedure will always converge. There's only one global minimum. Uh, there are no local minimum. So you can efficiently perform this optimization. That's why we care about convexity for the purposes of this talk, at least, that it allows efficient optimization algorithms. So returning to the harmonic oscillator case, and this is now um, getting more to what can be done in practice. So we can't possibly use a complete basis, but with our systematic with our less systematic example, where we just wrote down X plus IP, it's clear that we want X and P to be in the basis. So here's a nice three by three matrix, which must be positive semi-definite. It represents, it's only a small part of the full semi-definite program, but if we look at the lower two by two minor, just as we looked at the upper two by two minor on the one spin case, uh, we recover the constraint that the product of X squared and P squared expectation values must be at least one. And that's, I mean, that's the uncertainty principle, but it's also the thing that gives us the bound on the, uh, the lower bound on the ground state, Hamiltonian expectation value. Finally note that, so in this case, a bunch of constraints were dropped, right? So secretly out here, there's an X squared, there's a P squared, there are diagonal elements that look like X squared, P squared, and so on. There's a whole bunch of constraints that have been dropped, but adding more operators only makes this lower bound stricter. So, no matter, you know, if I, if I do this calculation, I can look at the lower bound and say, well, that the ground state energy is definitely at least that high. It could be higher. So this is sort of dual to the variational principle in that sense. Um, because if you, if you have two positive semi-definite so if you average all the expectation values, that's just the same as averaging these two matrices, right? If you have two positive semi-definite matrices, then you average them and that matrix is also positive semi-definite. Okay, one last view of what's going on here, just for intuition's sake. Um, so, so far I've phrased everything as just, we're searching through a space of matrices. But we can instead say, okay, uh, I'm used to solving the harmonic oscillator by noticing that the Hamiltonian can be written in the form a dagger a plus a half, right? That's usually how we how we do it in quantum mechanics class. And we go, ah, oh, well, a dagger a, that thing is positive semi-definite on its own. And then the plus a half means that I have a lower bound of one half in my energy. And you might say, aren't these two methods related? And these two methods are related. 
So it is completely equivalent to phrase things as I'm looking for some operator uh, O1 such that the Hamiltonian can be written as O dagger one plus O1, maybe plus more such things plus a constant, which might be negative. But then you immediately get the bound that your Hamiltonian expectation value is greater than or equal to that constant. And so sort of you can view this trick in the spin case, you can view this trick in the harmonic oscillator case. It is a theorem that this is in general equivalent to the semi-definite program formulation. I won't prove it here, but these are called these are called the dual problems, the dual formulations of the SDP. Okay. So if you prefer, and this method is called non-commutative sum of squares. And if you prefer thinking about it this way for intuition's sake, sometimes it is useful. Okay. So to summarize what's going on here, this is all just a general setup for how one can tackle quantum mechanical problems. We know that the space of permitted expectation values is some big convex space, and the ground state sits somewhere on the boundary. And to get to the ground state, all we have to do is walk down some linear function, which specifies the Hamiltonian. When I say linear, to be clear, it's linear in expectation values like the expectation value of x squared and the expectation value of xp. Solving a truncated SDP yields a rigorous lower bound. If we put in all the operators, that if we removed the truncation, that is, if we removed the truncation, then the lower bound would become tight. Okay. The outline of the rest of the talk, I'll have a quick foray into quantum information and a bit of history on the conformal bootstrap, which uh, uses a lot of these ideas. And then I'll talk about computational applications of this, particularly to lattice field theories, which is where my work has been. Okay. Are there any questions before I move on? Okay, no. So this whole story of so the convexity of the space of permitted uh, of permitted expectation values shows up in a few different ways in quantum information. So the first is suppose I have uh, two. They're Alice and Bob because this is quantum information. It's related to cryptography. Everyone is always named Alice and Bob. It is the law. So I have two physicists, we'll say Alice and Bob, and they know they're going to play this game where Alice is going to pick a random number with probability between one and n with probabilities that Bob already knows. Bob knows these probabilities. And Alice is going to, depending on the random number chosen, that, that number is a secret. It's the only secret. But Alice is going to send a quantum state, a bunch of entangled qubits, rho to Bob. And there are n possibilities for what state Rho is being sent. And Bob's job is to make a measurement on the quantum state and guess what quantum state he was given. Okay. And the question is, how well can Bob do? Can Bob guarantee success? What's the highest probability uh, of success that Bob can achieve? So from Bob's perspective, goes Bob. all I can do is I can make a measurement. So ultimately, I'm going to have a collection of operators, E sub J, and I'm going to measure uh, the expect I'm going to measure, project my state onto this space of, of different trajectories, and that'll give me some probability. You know, I'll measure the, it in, I'll measure J to be one with some probability, and I'll measure J to be two with some probability, and I'm going to apply whatever number I measure. So I know that the probability of me applying J is just the trace of the trajector times the density matrix. And I want to maximize the probability of success. Well, what's the probability of success? It's an expectation value over Alice's distribution, right? So I take a sum over all things Alice could have sent me, is the probability that Alice does that, multiplied by the probability that I, Bob, actually get the right answer. Subject to, well, now there are some constraints. The constraints turn out to be the, the uh, some of the traces of the projectors, I think so, add up to one. And moreover, that each projector is a positive semi-definite matrix. Those are my constraints. Um, that's an SDP, right? There are some matrices that I want to be positive semi-definite. Other than that, I have only linear constraints. The quantity I want to optimize is linear in what matters. It's linear in expectation values. So it's linear in all my unknowns. And so this is an occurrence of a semi-definite program in quantum information. And if you're interested in this sort of thing, there are four other examples in this paper on archive from last year by Situ and Tayor, at least one of whom I think is at CU Boulder. I don't remember about both of them. There was another example, maybe a little bit more famous, is called the NPA hierarchy. And this will actually be 
to some extent, the basis for what follows. So Alice and Bob have, both have access to half of a quantum system. So you can say they each have a set of operators they can measure. And Alice's operators, E sub alpha, commute with all of Bob's operators, E sub beta. Um, and a quantum correlation is this structure. So they're both going to perform some measurement, right? Alice makes a choice, I'm going to measure operator number two. Bob makes a choice, I'm going to measure operator number five. And then given that, they have a probability of measuring both spin up and both spin down or whatever. Uh, so they, which probabilities are achievable as quantum correlations is a question. And it is sufficient to simply impose positive semi-definiteness of all possible uh, all possible expectation values. Uh, so one defines a matrix gamma, and gamma is a, a you know the matrix of product expectation values of products of operators S. And as you increase the size of your basis S, you end up including all possible constraints on quantum correlations. Okay. And this connects ultimately to something called Cyrilson's problem, where you can ask, uh, does every quantum, quantum correlation, is every quantum correlation approximable by some finite dimensional Hilbert space? Uh, so is it the case that I can, I can write down a sequence of Hilbert spaces of finite dimension and states on those Hilbert spaces that attain every quantum correlation that satisfies all of these bounds? And the answer turned, was proven a couple years ago. Uh, to be no. There exist, although no explicit example is known yet, but it is known that there exist quantum correlations consistent with all of these bounds, which nevertheless can't be approximated by any sequence of finite Hilbert spaces. And the, this construction of the NPA hierarchy is relevant, uh, makes an appearance in this proof, although it is not at all the most the longest part. Sorry, yeah. You said it's sufficient that, that there are positive yet. It is sufficient uh, in order for a quantum correlation to be describable. Uh, uh, what do I want to say? Yes, I said it is sufficient that this matrix, these matrices gamma be positive semi -death. To do, to do what? Sorry. In order for a quantum correlation to be achievable, that is, there's some possibly infinite dimensional Hilbert space and some set of operators that Alice and Bob can measure uh, that would give that set of probabilities. Right. So this is, this is relevant. You should be thinking about this uh, for a point of reference as like a Bell's theorem type thing, right? Where you say, well, the set of possible quantum correlations is larger than the set of possible classical correlations, right? That's the sort of object we're talking about here. Okay. Um, I've already sort of beaten this to death, but I'll just say it again. Convexity is important because finding a global minimum is usually hard. Uh, so I can sort of draw arbitrarily mean functions where if you drop a ball at a random point and do a, a gradient descent or something, you end up in a false minimum. We're all familiar with this. But for convex functions, this is not the case. You can't have local minima. So you expect that you're going to be able to relatively quickly find the true global minimum. And there are a bunch of different software packages for solving SDPs. Uh, some examples given there. Mosaic is the one used for results in this talk there's certainly some room for improvement in this space. So in the past, physicists who have had to solve SDPs have eventually gone and written their own solver. Okay. Um, and there's a huge space of possible solving algorithms that is relatively underexplored. So just in the last few years, there was a lot of progress made on heuristic solvers. And see that archive reference if you're interested. All right, so now a bit of history about other bootstrap type methods, that is methods that involve semi-definite programs. So back in say the 60s or 70s before QCD was a, a well-established theory, there was a dream of constructing the S matrix of the universe simply by saying, well, I'm gonna demand that it be a unitary matrix. I'm going to demand that it obey various consistency com conditions. And just by imposing all of those conditions, maybe there's a unique S matrix. Or maybe there are interesting constraints that can be written about the S matrix of strong interactions. And this sort of fell out of favor, partly because, in fact, there isn't a unique S matrix, and partly because QCD became well understood, and we no longer needed to talk directly in terms of S matrices. 40 or so years went by, and this point of view got revived with the numerical conformal bootstrap. 
So if you want to study a conformal field theory, then you take this attitude of saying, okay, well, I'm going to demand the following symmetries. I'm going to demand conformal symmetry. I'm going to demand Lorentz invariance. I'll study the easing model, so I'll demand Z2 symmetry. And just from those, I will attempt to prove bounds on uh, operator scaling dimensions. And this wasn't accessible 40 years ago because the calculations are too complex to do by hand. However, uh, when combined with uh, modern numerical techniques, like the solvers I, I discussed previously, you actually can achieve non-trivial constraints on scaling dimensions and conformal field theories, which are in fact tighter than any other constraints that are known, including from the lattice. So just to review, a conformal field theory, it's Lorentz invariant, it's unitary, it's scale invariant, uh, which in fact, conjecturally that plus unitarity implies that it's conformal, has full conformal invariance, and it's characterized by critical exponents. In other words, the dimensions of some, the scaling dimensions of some operators. And a good reason to care if you're just a field theorist and you think you don't study conformal field theories is that at asymptotically high or low energies, every field theory is believed to become some conformal field theory, sort of because uh, you go to low enough energies and things stop changing as you keep scaling at lower and lower energies or vice versa at high energies. Uh, so we'd like to study them. And note that these are all linear constraints. The only nonlinear constraint is that uh, states have to have positive norm. And in, in conform, for the conform bootstrap, we quantize the states radially uh, rather than sort of equal time quantization that we're used to in quantum mechanics. Otherwise, it's very similar to the story we discussed many slides ago. And this is a plot from the 2016 paper by, I don't remember all the authors. The first one is, of course, uh, showing the tightest bounds obtained at that time on the scaling dimensions of the critical easing model. Notice that they have you know, a very nice problem to have in that it's actually quite difficult to produce the plot. They wanted to show the full Monte Carlo error bars. And if you do that, the bootstrap thing is this tiny line and they had to blow it up so you could see what's going on. This is a good problem to have. Okay. So now to talk about quantum mechanical systems for the rest of the day. So one thing we could do is we could say, I'm going to study individual eigenstates. And we have all of our commutation relations. We also have the fact that any time we have an expectation value with the Hamiltonian appearing on one end or the other, we can pull out the energy. We can say, OK, we don't know what the energy is, but we know that this is equal to the energy times some simpler expectation value. Well, this is a nonlinear constraint, and it breaks convexity. OK, so here we see the allowed regions for the for an anharmonic oscillator with energy shown on the x-axis, the expectation value of x squared on the y-axis. And there's sort of two, um, there's a refinement, so including only a few operators and then a few more operators on the inner region. And you can clearly see these regions are not convex. So in order to calculate the allowed region, what you have to do is do a scan in energies. And then for each energy, you get a, a, a now it's a convex optimization problem to determine the upper and lower bounds of x squared. Of course, if you include enough constraints, then for typical energies, like for instance, already for this inner region, if I start with an energy of 0.2, then I discover that, oh, there's no value of x squared that possibly allows all of my constraints to be obeyed, all of my, you know, my full matrix to be positive semi-definite. And therefore, I know that the energy of 0.2 is not actually achievable by the system. There's no eigenstate with that energy. So this is a nice method. It gives you uh, energies of individual states, but it does not. It, it requires this scan across energies, uh, which is computationally difficult and sort of a mess. Uh, another, another approach is to just say, OK, I'm just going to minimize the Hamiltonian. And this was done by Hahn, Hartnell, and Kuthoff. Uh, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, for matrix models. So these models are, you, you let X and P no longer be real, real number valued operators, rather they're N by N permission matrices. They obey the usual commutation relations that you would expect. And you can write down sort of, there's an ex easy exact and solvable Hamiltonian, and then there's a more complex Hamiltonian with uh, 
two distinct pairs of position and momentum matrices. These are the quantum, perfectly reasonable quantum mechanical systems. Larger matrix models, not any shown here, uh, such as BFSS, are believed to exhibit emergent space-time. So that's like the ultimate physics motivation is to have a theory that where you don't put space-time in as an input, but you see after the fact, oh, there's a black hole. Isn't that nice? Uh, so these simple matrix models, they, they looked at quickly. And a year and a half ago, in the bootstrap bounds, it's not a very large, it's not a very complicated uh, semi-definite, positive semi-definite matrix, but the bootstrap bounds very quickly converge almost exactly to the exact result. So the exact result is the line. And already for very, very small strings of operators, you find that the bootstrap bound is indistinguishable visually from the exact result. Similarly, for the harder Hamiltonian, uh, now the convergence is not quite as good. Uh, the dashed lines are various approximations, so no exact result is known. Uh, but you see that the bootstrap results are matching those analytic approximations fairly well. Okay. And the analytic approximations are, are, are difficult to get and understand somewhat, whereas the bootstrap bound at least is not. I don't know of any follow-up that tests, you know, at L equals five or whatever, uh, how how good the convergence is. Okay. L is, L is, yeah, I didn't put this on here. L is the length, so it's the size of the operator basis. It's the size of the basis of operators you're using. And it's the length of strings of X's and then P's that you're considering. Okay, so you put into your operator basis, so you're obviously going to put one, you're going to put X, you're going to put P, but you could do X to the A times P to the B as your general operator. And L is the upper limit on A plus B, if I remember correctly. Okay, and for details on this, on this, uh, see that VRL. Okay. Now to get to what I've been working on. So I need to do a quick foray into lattice field theory, uh, which may be familiar to everyone here, but just in case. Uh, so I can write down a quantum mechanical system that consists, consists of a bunch of lattice sites each of which has some degree of freedom living on it. So that might be a spin, it might be a scalar variable, it might be more than that. The full system has a nice tensor product Hilbert space uh, with the product taken over all those lattice sites. And I can now I can write down some Hamiltonian, preferably a local Hamiltonian coupling, coupling each lattice site to its neighbors. So for instance, for a nice spin system, I might have the transverse easing model Hamiltonian. And I've left off all minus signs and coupling co constants, of course. So if you think they're missing, you're correct. Um, why do I care about this? I mean, it's just another quantum mechanical system. But if I can tune the Hamiltonian so that I get large correlation lengths, then at the scale of the correlation lengths, the lattice is no longer visible. And I say, well, this is a good model of a continuous quantum field theory. Right? And so this is what's studied in lattice QCD, albeit in the action formulation. This is just the Hamiltonian version of the same. So one lattice Hamiltonian I can write down, I can take a, uh, a one-dimensional chain of degrees of freedom, each of which is a, harmonic, a quantum harmonic oscillator. And I can write down a Hamiltonian with a quadratic coupling between neighboring harmonic oscillators, and then an anharmonic, sort of, it's the only non-quadratic term in the Hamiltonian, an anharmonic local term. And this is a lattice model of phi to the four scalar field theory, of course. And this model can be simulated very efficiently on the Euclidean lattice. Uh, so that the, the Euclidean lattice simulation results are shown in black points with error bars. But I can also, with the bootstrap methods discussed here, attempt to get bounds on the energy density of this model. So that's what's shown on the y-axis. And you can see that well, first of all, note, note the scale of the y-axis. So even the worst bootstrap bounds that consider very a very small operator basis, even the worst bootstrap bounds are already within a few percent of the exact result. Explain the colors. Explain the colors. Uh, so this line is L equals 1 and equals 2. This line is L equals 3 and equals 4. And then the two next bounds are visually indistinguishable. Uh, maybe up here you can see the difference. But so L is the, so I'll have operators at some range of points. So I'll, I'll put, I won't put operators everywhere in space because that would be an infinite number of operators, but I'll put operators at, at lattice sites zero through some L. And that's what L is. 
and then n is the highest power of phi I consider. Uh, nowhere in this, by the way, my basis does not include, for instance, two-point operators. I, I don't bother to include those. They, they're apparently not necessary to get good bounds. The y-axis is the bound itself? The y-axis is the coupling constant. Okay, so this is a scan over different lattice field theories. So at, at here is the free theory, and here we're getting towards strong, oh, strong exactly. oh, the y-axis, sorry. Yeah, the y-axis is the bound or just the energy estimate from the, the energy density estimate from the lattice. So that's the solid top curve? Is that the... The solid top curve is the best bound obtained. The data points are the Monte Carlo. Right. And the point you should be, you should look at two, there are two prominent features of this plot. The first is that the L equals five and L equals seven lines are very, very close to each other. So you would suspect convergence just from looking at the bootstrap results. And the second is that th these are also within error bars of the Monte Carlo points. Yeah, because you have points that are below the bound. Yeah, of course. They're error bars. Uh, but the error bar seems to also be there are 20 points 25 points something like that shown so you expect one of them to be one or two to be several of them to be two sigma below and so i think that one's one sigma below that one's two sigma that one's two sigma that one's two sigma something like that um being somewhat accommodating for the possibility that the error bars are sloppily computed uh, i think it's it's within um there's also okay there's another bit of dark hidden here, which is, of course, that the Monte Carlo calculation is not performed in the infinite volume limit. So it's possible that there are finite volume effects, which are pushing the Monte Carlo around a bit. Um, I take this plot as evidence that there aren't really large finite volume effects because the Monte Carlo agrees with the uh, bootstrapped results, which is done in the infinite volume limit. But... Okay, so L equals seven to the bound that basically lines up with the data. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, Notice that the bound doesn't start to look really good until L is longer than the correlation length. The correlation length is five because the bare mass is 0.2. Of. Right, so the basis, right, good. So the basis of operators O that's used to construct the matrix is only local operators. But if you look at the matrix then, there's going to be a product of O0 dagger and then O at L, right? So there are two point functions that appear in this process, um, but there are not, the basis itself didn't need any non-local operators. When and, you yeah. see operators, right? I see a set of operators, but I don't know why you have those. And Completely also, arbitrary. So the game here is you-, so you I don't see a phi one to the, I mean, or, Oh, translational invariance is, is 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 asserted at some point. I forgot when you do when you do um. In order to do this thing at infinite volume, you need to assume translational invariance because otherwise the Hamiltonian out there could be negative a million. Um, but there's also a bunch of operators that are just clearly missing, right? I mean, there's three point operators, two point operators, and I don't know of any good explanation for why you don't need to include those operators as well. In fact, this has a precursor even in the anharmonic oscillator story, where I think the answer may be known, but I don't know it, where it turns out you don't need to include momentum operators in your basis, except just P. But you don't need P cubed, you don't need P to the fourth, you don't need P squared X squared in order to get tight bounds. And I don't understand why this is the case. It may be understood, uh, but not in the papers I've read. Okay. Also, there's something that we do like five, so it's all that there would be a... Zero isn't an odd number. Okay. And there's a two, there's dots here, so it's five, two, five, three. No, sure, but yeah, yeah, but like the cells of one, three, five, seven. Oh, that. I think I didn't want the clock to be too crowded. If I remember correctly, I made it with all of them, and there were a lot of indistinguishable lines. Um, it could also be that. Uh, you get improvements that are sort of discrete. So L equals three and L equals four might be very similar to each other. I don't remember. Sometimes that happens. Um, there's certainly nothing wrong with putting an even L. Okay. Now this is this is like underwhelming because I mean the Monte Carlo was a lot easier to do than it was to write the code to get these these lines. Okay. So you shouldn't be impressed. Now there's a hard problem on the lattice 
which is if you want to simulate a finite density of relativistic fermions. So let's say you want to look at QCD at large baryon chemical potential, um, as some people do. Uh, this is necessary for studying the structure of neutron stars. What you're going to measure on, what you would like to measure on the lattice is the equation of state. You'd like to measure, say, the number density as a function of chemical potential. And this can be translated into the into a mass radius curve for neutron stars. But the lattice simulation has what's called a fermion sign problem. Uh, briefly, when you do a lattice simulation, you're going to sample with respect to some probability distribution and compute expectation values with respect to that probability distribution. If you try to simulate a theory with a finite density of fermions, you typically find that what you thought was a probability di distribution is not and can't be sampled with respect to. Okay, And then you try to fix that and you run into other problems and so on. It's a long story on its own. For the purposes of today, I'll just say that's a problem we're not going to try to solve directly. However, we can ask, well, what happens with these bootstrap methods if you attempt to tackle a lattice system with a finite density of fermions? Do they perform any worse? And so the next uh, few slides are just to convince you that, no, they don't perform worse at a finite density of fermions. So we'll look at the lattice tiering model. This is, again, a one-dimensional or one plus one-dimensional lattice field theory. Uh, it's Hamiltonian if you want to squint. The important parts are free Hamiltonian, you know, free fermions hopping along a lattice, chemical potential so that I can add a finite density of fermions, and a quartic coupling term with uh, four Fermi interactions. And these are fermionic operators, so they obey anti-commutation relations like so. At finite chemical potential, the lattice Monte Carlo methods have a sign problem, but we can tackle this with uh, the bootstrap. And so there's the exact result is the solid line and the sequence of uh, bootstrap approximations to it, which are convert which start out fairly close to the exact result and are converging to it. So this is done on a 10-site lattice with bare parameters like so. The physical fermion mass on this lattice is just around 0.2 in lattice units. So again, a correlation length of about five. Uh, these operator bases labeled H0 through H2 and C1 are going to be described on the next slide. For now, the point is just to look at this plot and go, OK, that doesn't seem substantially worse than, than I might have hoped. Now, OK, I, I have to describe the operator bases. These are a bit complicated for the tiering model. Uh, just very quickly, the simplest basis we can do to get a non-trivial bound, I need to include at every site all possible operators at that site. Otherwise, there's no bound possible on the Hamiltonian. That's just because the Hamiltonian expectation value needs to be expressible as a linear combination of the matrix elements of my PSD matrix. And then H1, H2, and C1 are subsequent refinements. H1 and H2 are adding terms that already appear in the Hamiltonian. And then C1 was obtained by, by guess and check of what types of operators improve things. Uh, Simeon pointed out to me that C1 can be obtained by considering the commutator of the Hamiltonian with these operators. And so maybe that's a good motivation. Uh, OK, full set of result plots. So on the top, we have the simulations on a 10-site lattice. The left-hand side is showing the energy. Uh, so that's a bunch of bounds, right? If you're calculating the energy, you're getting a lower bound. The right-hand side on the top is showing the estimate for the total fermion number, okay? So the left plot is actually the integral with appropriate signs stuck in various places of the right-hand plot. So where the right-hand plot often has steps, the left-hand plot has kinks and so on, okay? And uh, what's notable here partly is that if you try to get the fermion number at a point, it looks a little bit less reliable. It looks like less of a good approximation than if what you're asking for is the integral of the fermion number between saturation density and some finite mu. Okay. So that, that's the fact that the left-hand plot looks much better than the right-hand plot. Also, not all approximations. So when you increase the chemical potential, you expect to always have an integer fermion number. That's because the fermion number operator commutes with the Hamiltonian, and not all approximations obtain that fact. So H2 does, but the others, this is not a generic, this is not automatically done by the bootstrap. Um, nevertheless, even where you, don't, you have non-integer fermion number, you can see that 
for the better approximations, it's mostly giving you a sort of smoothed approximation to the true result. Finally, doing these uh, calculations at infinite volume with much higher, much larger operator bases. Uh, and again, you can see as you go to the solid lines and sort of the improved uh, bases, you can see something that looks a, a bit like convergence. So you can get a qualitative view of what the equation of state is at infinite volume. Uh, with that, I think I'll conclude. Uh, so sort of where to go next, there are direct extensions of this. One could look at fermions, first quantized quantum mechanical fermions for studying something like nuclear structure uh, and extending these methods to actually get to the continuum limit where there are some scaling issues or to get finite temperature physics or to get real-time correlation functions are all pretty much open problems. More ambitiously applying this to QCD, uh, doing this in momentum space where you might hope the continuum limit is more accessible or the Euclidean path integrals. Uh, that one's been worked on a bit. See uh, that paper from a few months ago. The advantage to Euclidean path integrals is that you can bound not just the Hamiltonian expectation value, but get upper and lower bounds on any other expectation value. So that's an attractive generalization. Anyway, with that, thank you. Thank you, Scott, for this very simple. Uh, I think there's some time for questions. You probably want to keep the previous slide. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by momentum space? So the operators I wrote down here all lived at a lot of sight. And it shouldn't be obvious that that's the best way to get quick convergence to the uh, to the true result. So I could imagine instead writing down, you know, the Fourier transform of phi, you know, operators that live on momentum modes. And one reason to suspect that this does better is that for the free theory, uh, so that's actually this slide that I didn't get into much, but so this is studying the convergence of bootstrap methods for just a free scalar field, uh, sorry, the free tiering model. Um, it's zero coupling. And you don't, with no finite operator basis in position space, do you get the exact result because of course you haven't picked up on, you know, the contribution from very, very low momentum modes. Whereas if you're studying the free theory and you write down sort of a two operator basis uh, where the operators are in momentum space, you get immediately an exact result. And for that momentum mode, of course, because the momentum mode is decoupled. So for that reason, you might hope that, you know, maybe if I go to momentum space, I'll get faster convergence and I'll be able to study the continuum limit a bit better. Does that depend on uh, how close you are to a free theory or, the, or you know, if you have an interacting theory? Probably it's, yeah, so. Is the, is the position better? I don't know. That's why it's on the open, open question slide. But, um. I mean, it's sort of, it, it, okay, it has to be, position space has to be somewhat better at free theories just because I know it's perfect at free theories and it's not going to be immediately solve it with a two operator basis for interacting theories. How much worse it gets at strong coupling? I have no idea. Right. And so the, the point of this slide is that as you increase the correlation length, that is, as you decrease the mass, the convergence of bootstrap methods gets worse because you have to consider a larger basis to get larger separations of operators. Obviously, that disappears if you go to momentum space. I can make a little like, small comment. So like uh, momentum and position space, they are dual. So the operators which have large support in uh, coordinate space have very small support in momentum space and vice versa. So but that's... Uh, one thing to keep, maybe one need actually uh, basis of a great addiction to be like a great addiction support in that space and for the other space. Or the other space. Yeah, it's just unclear to me how to relate that to how strong the couple of system is. Which one is better? Where? Yeah, I I. I... There, there's a lot about the the in practice performance of SDPs that I find mystifying. Like you run the calculation, you know, you run a Monte Carlo and you look at you know how well it performs, and usually this is related in a straightforward way to some physical quantities, and I, I know why it's. And with SDPs, I mean, you can look at this plot and you can see this bizarre oscillating behavior, where the size of the error bounces up and down, 
uh, you can see how the estimate for the number density sort of oscillates around the true result. And why it does this, I have no idea. So I'm, I'm just leaning on the theorem that it converges in the limit, but. Right, so infinite is because the, for bootstrap methods, you never have to write down the Hilbert space. So the fact that the Hilbert space is say infinite dimensional because I have an infinite size lattice doesn't matter. I can write down some finite set of operators and say that's a set of constraints on the infinite volume system. So in that sense, this calculation, these calculations are true calculations done in the infinite volume limit. But the fact of the matter is the operators I need are going to have some, I write down, are going to have some finite radius. And in the estimates you calculate, you end up having finite volume effects that are a consequence of that radius. So while the bounds are true in the infinite volume limit, um, it's a little deceptive to call these infinite volume results. You have something that looks a lot like a finite volume effect, right? And it's just from how large of a region did you consider when talking about your constraints? I guess, strictly speaking, if you did something in momentum space, it would now be infinite volume. No, only if you considered arbitrarily low momentum would it be infinite volume, right? So you get the same effect. And so then whether you call it infinite volume is a matter of terminology. I don't, I don't know what to say. Let's uh, take stuff again. Oh, wait. Scott, uh, someone asked a question. Uh, Rob, Rob is asking a question. Uh, Rob? Yeah, uh, you said that in general, your system works well if uh, it's gapped, and it's much harder if it's not gapped? When you're doing position space, certainly, yeah. I see. Now, if I'm at finite density, though, I mean, then I don't have a gap yeah. near the Fermi. So, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. I agree. Um, um, I have nothing wise to say, right? I mean, I can I can <laughs> point to these plots. I can point to these plots and say, yeah, it works okay. I don't see any phenomenon. So you might expect, for instance, on on those grounds to do much better at zero chemical potential than at large chemical potential. Yeah. Um, which is not the case in, in these plots. Um, I could say that at finite volume, I still have a gap here. Maybe that explains what's going on. Yeah, but that's a small gap. Yeah, okay. Not actually, and, yeah, actually no, I'm, I'm thinking about the eigenvalues now. It's not actually that small. Maybe that's a good excuse for why this is working well at finite volume. I see, I see. And now, and let me ask you a different question. Um, in a system at non-zero density, yeah. you're interested in both the excitation energy and also uh, the response in real time in the damping constant. And you know you want to know the relative ratio of the damping constant to the energy to tell if it's a Fermi or a non-Fermi liquid. Is it easy for you to get the um, damping constant? No, no, no. And and by not easy, I mean I have no idea how to do it. So this only no, that's okay. this only lets me even make estimates, not even bounds at this at this point, but estimates for uh expectation values of operators that are not time dependent. So the application of this to finite density systems right now is just the hope that there's some information about the equation of state itself. Everything else, like damping constants, for now, I have no idea how to do. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but that's still. That's it's still a big zero. deal. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. And could I ask in your tiering model, how does this compare to using something like DMRG? Uh, I, I don't know. I, uh, Fair I, enough. If I had to guess, I would guess that DMRG is going to outperform this. Yeah, um, but, th but that's, that's special good. to one plus one. That's very special to one plus one. On the other and, hand, I have not done yeah. careful tests in two plus one. So there's no guarantee. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. I see nothing that's about, fine. to be fair, I see nothing about this that should be special to one plus one, unlike the MRG, but uh, I haven't tested it. 
Yeah, and could I ask one last question since you're an expert in this? So it, how how hard if you want to know like critical exponents is some transition first order or second order Excellent. then you presumably have to go to huge bases of thousands tens of thousands or something uh that's what it looks like so i tried to do this with the transverse easing model um to yeah. not i didn't even want to determine the critical exponents i just said you know i'd be pretty happy to determine the critical magnetic field sure. and but as you expect from from this this bad news plot uh, when you tune yourself to the critical magnetic field, the approximation effects get very, very bad. And so I think the true critical mu is around 3, 3.044, I want to say. And if you produce plots of susceptibility as a function of magnetic field strength using the bootstrap, you typically find peaks at like 4. So it's off by 33%. Um, and that was going to as, as large bases as I could manage on my computer with my bad software. So we're, unless the momentum space thing hugely helps for that, then this method isn't useful there yet. But but then there are people who do all this stuff, right? And in, in three dimensions and calculating critical exponents. Are you talking about so the they must be taking... Yes, yeah, but that's done, so that's done in radial quantization um, and with a few extra linear constraints coming from conformal invariance. What's radial quantization? Um, so this is, I'll do it, I'll define by analogy. This is equal time quantization. You take your space time, you draw lines of equal time. You say associated to that line is a Hilbert oh. space. Radial quantization, you draw circles or spheres associated to your sphere is a Hilbert space, which means that the equivalent of the Hamiltonian is the dilation operator, right? Whose eigenvalues tell you what the dimensions of various operators are. Yeah, yeah, okay. 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 But thank you for the nice talk. I've heard so much about bootstrapping. It's like, what exactly is going on? And the reviews aren't easy. Yeah, this is the easiest form of bootstrap. That's why I do it. Yeah, no, no, very <laughs> nice. Very nice. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Thanks. I don't want to risk breaking your computer. Nah. <laughs> just don't pull the cable. Oh, that's easily fixed. So we'll just ah, problem solved. <laughs>